OK. So a contingency table is just something that summarizes data for two categorical variables. Week one, remember, categorical variables are those which, rec which record qualitative data about something. So hair color, some status as to your citizenship, your gender, those are categorical variables. Your weight, your height, those are not, those are quantities, those are quantitative variables, and so those would not be considered categorical in most situations. So here's a, just a simple example of two categorical variables, which is the gender of the people surveyed and whether or not they were looking for a spouse while enrolled in tertiary education, that is university. You are here, and the question is, if the right person were to come along and walk in your door, are you open to the idea of finding a permanent life partner? Yes or no? And some people are like, yeah, no, not happening. And some people are like, sure, why not? And some people are like, yes, that is why I'm at university, is to find someone. It takes all kinds to make the world go round. Whatever is your way of doing things is totally fine. So it's just a breakdown of the different categories. And so if we scan down the looking for spouse, what we see is that the majority of you are in the no category. There are a few people in the yes. They say, yeah, I'm looking for someone. I'm looking for a partner. Um, you know, maybe I won't find them, but that's kind of something that's in the back of my mind. And that's just the totals. Then we can go, well, within those totals, let's see how the genders get broken down. And what we see in this particular survey is that in the female male case, it looks like females are 86 to 51, no to yes, for 137 total females, whereas the male are 52 to 18. Now, we can't overgeneralize from this. It's just a survey. But what you can do is you can look at those numbers. You can say, well, 86 is bigger than 51. 52 is bigger than 18, but as percentages of their total for the gender, we could go across here and we could find 86 over 137 and 51 over 137 as the percentages of the female surveyees who are actually not or yes in the looking for spouse category. Whereas the males are 52 over 70, no, and 18 over 70, yes. And what is the one thing we see from those numbers? Don't overgeneralize it, but what's the one difference there? There were more women surveyed, but more women as a percent are open to looking for a spouse in tertiary education than the men who say, you know, 52 out of 70 are like, no. That's a much higher percentage than 86 out of 137. So this is what a contingency table looks like. And we'll be analyzing contingency tables for the rest of the semester. And they keep coming up. They are a way of taking categorical things that you might be interested in and giving you a method for analyzing them with respect to each other. This is a common way to display these categorical variables. It's called a bar plot. So a bar plot is set up so that we total across one of the rows or down one of the columns in a categorical variable contingency table layout and then we simply display bars which are the appropriate heights and so in this case we have the 130 what was it seven yeah 137 females that's how high this is and the 70 males and the problem with this is that you look at it and you say, well, that's nice. I mean, it shows you the overall difference in sheer number, but we're actually really bad at kind of doing numbers on the fly as humans. And so what is often a better way of displaying it is what is called the relative frequency version, where you have exactly the same bars. So they're the same sizes, but the y-axis is rescaled to be out of one. And so the sum of the heights of all of the bars adds up to one, 100%. And so when we look at this, what we have is that these two numbers together, number one and number two, number one plus number two is 1.00. So they're rescaled. They're exactly the same plot. And in fact, if you use a plotting routine in Excel or R or anything, they're created in exactly the same way. But then it takes the y-axis 
and divides it by the total number of people in the categories as a whole. So if we go back up quickly, there were 207 total survey completions. And so down here, this is created by taking the numbers that were there and divide it by 207. And so it rescales it so that you can then say, well, OK, that's interesting. The women in the surveys, that was about seven out of every 10 surveys completed was with a woman and only three, three, you know, 35% ish, 30% ish were completed with males. And so that's something that's interesting that we can easily get when you have the relative frequency presentation. And that's very common. In fact, histograms are typically done in this way because it allows you to do the percentages in an easier way. So how are these different from histograms? So bar plots are specifically for displaying distributions of categorical variables, whereas histograms are used for numerical variables. So that's the big difference. They look kind of the same. The big thing here is that we obviously only have two bars. and most histograms, you have at least five or six. And you could, you could have more. The problem is we don't have six or seven genders, not at least in common understanding. And if you did, if you did kind of break people down into their self-identified genders, the problem is you wouldn't have enough data because it's the very, very small percentages of the population don't identify as either male or female. Small enough that getting statistical quality to your data would be tricky. So in a bar plot, you can list them in any order. Um, often we list them in the order that makes sense, largest to smallest, smallest to largest, or some sort of interpretation that makes sense in an ordinal fashion, where if we were doing, say, the weekdays, and there was some quality that was obsessed by the weekdays, we'd do them in the common calendar ordering. You wouldn't go Thursday, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Tuesday. You'd go Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Because we all can kind of parse that and go, oh, weekend, week, weekend. We'd understand that. So how do you choose the appropriate portion? So this is what we were talking about. You can, you can go across and you can convert these numbers into percents. So this says from this little table that of the 207 people surveyed, 137 were female and 51 of those 137 were looking for a spouse and that was 37% of the surveyed female participants. Whereas the males were 18 were yes, and there were 70 of them, and so the total was only 26%. And this is opening the door now to the statistics. This is week three, we're actually gonna get started now with some actual computations and tests. The question you might ask yourself is, well, those are obviously not the same number, but are they different enough? Because, you know, you can get things that are entirely by random chance, right? If you take your GPA and compare it to someone else, and you've had one semester of courses, they may be different, and it may reflect nothing more than different classes, not different academic ability. So the question is, just because those are different, are they different enough that we have what is to be said as a statistical finding? Can we say something about that to say, yeah, that's different enough that clearly women want to get married and men totally don't. And let's overgeneralize and talk about how 20 somethings are clearly not tied down anymore. Millennial, millennial, millennial. You have read the paper lately, right? Like, you know, that's, that's what they do. They're like, millennials are killing avocados. Millennials are killing, you know, all kinds of things. And it's like, not really. It's just cultural change, you know, like stop trying to make a mountain out of a molehill. So the question there we might ask is, really, is there a difference? Is there a cultural difference in the willingness of 20-somethings, early 20-somethings, to be thinking about long-term relationships and family structure and all that kind of stuff between women and men? And this might be how you would start analyzing a question like that. So here's some other ways of presenting this data. So in the first bar plot we did, we just showed males and females. And that's interesting, but it didn't really give us a sense of what the study was all about. It was just the total number of people in the survey, which I could tell you by just giving you two numbers. The bar plot told us nothing. These are variations on a bar plot. So here, what we see is a bar plot where we have the same stacks, that's 137 and 70, but we've used color to represent the breakdown between the no's and the yeses. And so we have no, yes, and yes, no. 
And that's interesting because now we're starting to get a sense of things uh, overall. If we wanted to compare the two columns, though, the problem is, again, we have 70 in one category and 137 in another, and those numbers are hard to directly get sense of. So you can rescale things so that every column, every bar, adds up to 100% of that category. And so we have 100%, 1.00 of the females and 100% of the males. And what we see here is that same difference we were talking about. The numbers were 26 and 37%. So that was 2.6 and that was 3.7. And now we can see that graphically. And that lets us at a quick scan go, ah, it looks like more females than males are willing to you know, consider finding a spouse in university in this survey. And maybe that leads you to a research hypothesis and so on. And so that is a nice way of presenting it. The main problem with that is that we've now lost the sense that we had from the first set of bar plots where we could see that clearly our survey was not balanced. We asked a lot more women than men their opinion on this matter. And that can be a problem if you don't have a population that is a lot more women than men, which we don't. Our population is almost 50-50, women to men, which means if you're going to do a survey about cultural sort of mores and policies, you need to balance it with the actual population you're interested in generalizing to. So we look at that and we're like, well, we, we surveyed too many women. And that second plot masks that. You could actually, and some people have, entitled this first year course as how to lie with statistics. Because you can, very, very easily, through very non-judgmental selections of scales and axes and colors and presentations, you can make something look like something else. And so that second one is, is, while it does give us a nice comparison of those numbers, it isn't great because it masks the fact that women were surveyed almost 50% more than men. The last plot is what is known as a mosaic. And it tries to have the best of both worlds. So it tries to give us this breakdown here, where this height is 100%. But it uses this side to side to give us the number surveyed. And this whole thing is called a mosaic plot. And what we see from this is we can read off the difference there. We can see the difference that we saw before between 26 and 37. but it retains this sense that actually the females were surveyed more. And at a glance, you're like, oh, that's actually, we need to be careful there. We don't maybe have enough males surveyed to really fill this thing out. So these are presentations. And really, they're designed to be very easy to read. They're not designed to have a lot of detail in them. They're summaries. And this, this assignment you have right now is starting to ask you to, well, actually, no, assignment two asked you to look at that a little bit. Here's another way of looking at these. We talked about stem and leaf plots or, uh, and variations thereof, and these plots invented by John Tukey last time we were here. So this is a box plot, and these are, remember, this is a whisker, and this is a box. You should, from the last lecture and from this last assignment, be able to identify what all the different pieces of one of these is or are. This is a median in here. These represent Q1 and Q3. And then this is the IQR. And then you do the whiskers from that. So this allows us to scan across. And we're interested in the number of clubs that students are in and whether there is a relationship between that number and the year of your study in a four-year program at university. And so what it looks like is that in first year, there is quite a large top whisker. So that's saying that you know there are a few people who just don't join a club. Academics is first. Everything else doesn't matter. And there's a lot of people who join between 0 and 2. So 50% of the population is between 0 and 2 clubs. And then the rest of the population, the other 50%, is between 2 and 6. And six is the top end of clubs that people are involved in, which is that's a lot of clubs to be involved with. In sophomore year, 
you'll notice that the median stays approximately the same. That's the thick line. So this is, again, the median here. Median sits at two clubs. You'll notice that there is no Q1 because Q1 is the same as the median. So that actually gets squished together. So this is both the median and Q1, which means that 25% of sophomores are in exactly two clubs. Not between 0 and 2, but exactly 2 because they're in that line. And we pull up the IQR scaling. And in fact, now we have outliers down at 0. And it looks like almost everybody joins a club by second year. But up at the top end, most of the population caps out at 4 because they've realized that sleep is nice. And these people are the crazy ones. Those are the outliers. Then in third year, things look basically the same, except the club's median goes up. And so the median value is now three. So maybe people are getting stable. They're kind of in clubs where they don't to put in a lot of effort, but they enjoy the community. They join maybe one more. And then in fourth year, the median drops back down. And it looks like everybody's in somewhere between one and four clubs. So this is all the way up to the 75th percentile. And then these are the top 25%. And this lets us actually see what happens over time. Because these are first years, second years, third years, and fourth years. And while it is a snapshot of a population, you can see the way that behavior changes over time as you're, you get busier. Because you think you're busy now, wait till you hit fourth year, and you'll laugh at how you thought first year was busy. It's somehow, you get used to it, and they ramp it up one more tier. And then you get used to it, and then they do it again. Then you go to grad school, and you realize you didn't actually even know what was going on. Or you go get a job, and, and actually, that gets crazy. And then you have a life and a family, and it never lets up, basically. It never lets up. Question? Well, can the quantiles always So the question is, can the quantiles intersect one another? Absolutely. In a case with discrete data, which this is, they can very easily. If it's continuous data, it's very difficult to do. You'd have to really compress it. But here, you can't join a quarter of a club. You're either in a club or you're not. So the number of clubs totally shown on this thing is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. And so what happened there in the second and the third years is that the quantiles and the median got squished together because actually of the total population of students, 25% or more were in that one little area, that one number, 3 or 2. And so that compressed the graph together. Question? So this comes down to the diagram that I used last lecture. If, you're, if you want to compute percentages based on one of these box plots, let me just erase my stuff off the fourth years and we'll do it here. You know the breakdowns of all these lines. This is the 50% point. This is 75. This, because there are no outliers, is 100. And this is 25% and also 0. because there's no actual whisker out the bottom. So what, what can we say about this? This says that 50% of this senior class is in one or two clubs. And we know that less than 50% is in one club, but we don't know exactly how it breaks down beyond that. We can also say that 75% of the senior class is in four or less clubs. And if you wanted to, this is 50%. So you can say at least 50% of the class is in 0, 1, 2, sorry, 1, 2, 3, or 4 clubs. And, and there, there have been a number of questions that we've asked you about things like this. Um, there was the question about salaries of lawyers on the assignment. We've asked you a question on the quiz that was on box plots. And it's really just going, OK, these lines are all I know. So that's the information I have to work with. One of those lines is going to give me the answer that I need for this question. And that's, that's all it is to a question like that. So if you took all of the seniors and the number of clubs they were in, and you sorted it into ascending order, this here says that the set of club numbers 
would start at 1 and would go on for a while. And then eventually, we start having 2s and so on. And what this says that when you do the quantiles, Q1 and Q2, the median and the 25%, the 25% is in here somewhere on a 1. And the 50% is in there. And that's all it means. So if you have discrete data and you sort it, then the quantiles are going to lie in one of the discrete areas. And then the quantile will be that. And it just can happen that you have enough ones that when you take all of them and you're like, okay, there's 100 of them. The 25th is a 1. And the 50th is still a 1. And that can happen. And that's what's happening in the case of the sophomores. The 2 number is the 25% and every bit between it and the 50%. And then maybe a bit to the left and a bit to the right. And then somewhere in there it decays from being you know, a 2 to a 1 because there's some people down there. And then eventually to a 0. Make sense? OK, so this is just, again, it's a way of comparison, comp uh, comparing data. All right, this is the last topic from chapter one. This is a pie chart. You've all seen a pie chart before, right? If any of you want to fess up to using a pie chart in some sort of report in high school? Anybody? A few people? OK. That was then. This is now. Tell me what this says. So what order of the orders of mammal species is the lowest percentage? I mean, this is a graphical presentation, right? You should be able to just look at it and tell me the answer. Or maybe not. This is a really bad graphical presentation. You look at it, you're like, I don't know what's going on in here. Like, basically, you could take this whole area and just put a big question mark over it. Like, what is going on? I don't know. I don't know which one's bigger or smaller. It's just a bunch of gibberish. In a sense, it might be construed as an insult to a man's intelligence to show him a pie chart. 1923, forgive him his gender-specific language. But yes, pie charts are garbage. And if I ever see you using one in my class or in any context at this university, I will find a lemon meringue pie, and I will hunt you down, and I will give you a pie chart. Don't do it. Why? We are human. That means we are good at some things, bad at others. One thing that humans are particularly bad at is judging angles and angle differences. If you see one angle and another angle and they're rotated from one another, you cannot tell which one is bigger with any degree of certainty. We're not birds. Birds are really good at telling angles because they fly. And they need to be able to zoom on weird angles to catch things like, you know, little things that they eat. We, as humans, we're very much on the ground. And we're very much bad at telling angles apart. And so the point of a pie chart is supposed to be present data so that the reader can, at a quick glance, tell the difference between the quantities. And angles don't work that way. So pie charts are actually genuinely bad at their only job. The only good thing about them is that they look like pie, and pie is tasty. So this is a good pie chart. Why? Because it's not a pie chart. It's a picture. It's the sky, and that's the sunny side of the pyramid, and that's the shady side of the pyramid. All right, to pick on a dead man. This is Steve Jobs in 2009, I think, before he got cancer. He is trying to do a presentation about the iPhone. He's talking about market share of the iPhone. What is wrong with this picture? It's got numbers on it, so you know how big each one's supposed to be. Does anyone see a problem with this pie chart? According to this pie chart, because of the forced 3D perspective, Apple has a much bigger share percentage than the other category. And in fact, looks as big as Palm and Motorola and Nokia together and is only second to RIM at the time. The BlackBerry was still very much powerful at that time. Is it? Well, this number is bigger than that number. So what is going on? They've taken the pie chart, and they've done it as a 3D pie chart, and then they've rotated it into the page. And the green one looks a lot bigger because of it, because we're really bad at telling angles. Lying with pie charts. Final pie chart I'll show you. 
A pie chart about your favorite pies. I will forgive this one, again, because pies are tasty. But don't use pie charts. They're genuinely bad at doing what they're supposed to do. Use a bar chart instead. It's not as pretty, but it actually shows the truth instead of masking it like you can see was done there. Okay, chapter two. We are done with chapter one. Uh, we will keep using the language from chapter one periodically throughout the course. We will obviously be building on that, but that's the end of chapter one. We wrapped up, and now we're going to move into chapter two, and we're going to start with a case study from a psychology journal. 1972, so we're going back a few years, well before any of us were born, and some psychologists performed a study on gender discrimination. So it was actually at a retreat. So they had a bunch of um, bank supervisors, bank managers, the sort of people who had gone to this professional retreat. And they did a study where they came up to them and they said as part of the team building exercise or whatever, they were given a personnel file and they're, they're asked to make a determination as to if this person worked for you, would you promote them? Are they manager material? Right. So 1972. It's told that the job is fairly routine, but whether that person should be promoted to it. So it's 48 male bank supervisors. At the time, there were very, very few female bank supervisors. And the files were actually identical. Every single bank manager was given the same file. The only difference was that 24 of them had John Smith at the top. The other 24 had Jane Smith at the top. Only difference. And they just shuffled them all together and handed them out. So it didn't, wasn't sort of these people who sat over here were given the females and those were given the males. It was completely random. Nobody saw anybody else's file. And it was just set up so that each bank manager randomly received a male file or a female file. That's the setup of the experiment. Of these 48, 35 of the bank managers chose to promote the candidate, said, yes, this is a routine job. This is a good file. I would totally promote this person. Obviously, by process of elimination, 13 would not. 13 people were told, no, you would not be promoted. They were checking to see whether there was gender bias in the hiring promotion process. Is this observational or experiment? At the back? Why? That's true. Be careful to try and prove it through positive like you're doing, because you're trying to say what an observational study is instead of just saying what is an experiment. That's the key. The researchers were interfering in the process. They didn't just distribute the same file to everyone. They didn't distribute one female, one male to everyone. They randomized who got what file and created a control and a treatment group manually. Question. So in, uh, in this group, the control and treatment is a little bit different because what's actually being done is that we have 48 male bank managers as our population and they're randomly being assigned to male and female. That's kind of the key. And so 24 of them are being assigned to the you got a male file group, which is the control, and 24 of them are being assigned to the female group. That's the treatment. So that's the setup. It is an experiment because they interfered. And furthermore, you know, obviously set up control and treatment. So this is the results, 48 files. Of the 24 bank managers who were given male files, 21 said, yes, this is a good candidate for promotion. I would promote this person. Three said no. For the 24 bank managers randomly assigned the female files, 14 said yes, and 10 said no. So the percentages, again, we, we convert to a metric where we can compare apples to apples. 87.5% of the males were promoted, and 58.3% of the females were promoted. At first glance, does there appear to be a problem? Yes. 
And that's fairly obvious. The question is, though, how certain are we of that? Could it have happened just by chance? Could it have been that most of the female files were given to the hard asses in the room and the male files were given to the softies who promote anybody with a pulse? You know, it could happen, right? So the question is, is this a real finding? Does this actually demonstrate gender bias? So we saw 29.2%, 0.292. Based on that information, which of these four statements is true? So this is a practice. Number one, if we would repeat it, definitely we would see more females. This was just a fluke. So if we got another 48 bank managers and another 48 files and we set it all up again and we did it again, it wouldn't be this bad. This was just a fluke. Number two, promotion is dependent on gender. Males are more likely to be promoted. There is gender discrimination against female, females in promotion decisions. Okay, number three, the difference is due to chance and this is not evidence of gender discrimination. And number four, women are clearly less qualified than men and that is just why that they weren't promoted. The fact that a female name was at the top meant that they automatically discounted it because women are bad at job. Which of these is false? Four and one. One and four are definitely false. And anybody who wants to say different on four, this room is 70% female. The door's over there. They will chase you. <laughs> Two and three, which one is it? We don't know. We genuinely don't know. It could be two. It could be a real finding. Or it could be three. It could be chance. And we actually don't know. It's not that it was due to sort of some sort of weird cultural thing where women are actually just bad at bank managing. That's four. And it's not that this was just a fluke. We can't say that for sure. But it could be one of two or three. Maybe. And this is the point of this course, is to train you to be able, through mathematical and computational reasoning, to tell the difference between these two. Not explicitly, no. Um, what replication comes into is if you concluded two, your finding will be even stronger if you are able to do replication. And you do replication within a study, which is to say you do more and more cases, in order to be able to distinguish between two and three. That's what it's for. It gives you more cases, therefore it gives you more ability to tell the difference between the two. So two competing claims, two arguments. Devil's Advocate, you've got the little white Darth Vader and the little black Darth Vader on your shoulders talking to you, telling you which way is which. There's nothing going on. This is what is called the null hypothesis. Null is an old word for zero or nothing. So it is the nothing hypothesis. There's nothing going on, nothing to see here. Move along, carry on. There is nothing going on. They are independent. There was no gender discrimination. And the observed difference that we saw of 29% that was just by chance, it just happened on that day that the people who got the female files were in a bad mood. That's option A. Versus the alternative hypothesis. There is something going on. There is a dependency between the two. There is a relationship between the gender of the file and the promotion chance. There is gender discrimination, therefore, and that observed difference is not due to chance. This is how we set things up. This is like a, a criminal trial or a civil trial, more so in the US than Canada, at least in terms of um, what everybody's familiar with. I assume everyone has seen an episode of Law and Order, even if you didn't want to. You know, it's been, it has 23 seasons of the main show and so on. Like there's, there's tens of thousands of episodes of Law and Order. You've all seen a criminal trial, at least made up in the United States. So you kind of have a basic sense of how these things go. Null hypothesis is the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights or the Justinian Codes, the, the sort of English common law, Western law system that we all inherited from the Brits, who in turn inherited it from the Byzantines, which just says that when you are performing a trial, the default assumption of that trial is that the defendant is innocent. You are innocent until proven guilty. There are other legal systems where it's just, if you're in front of the court, you are assumed to be guilty straight away, and you have to prove your innocence. 
those are not what our legal system is based on. We then present the, the evidence, we collect data, we demonstrate what's going on, and in the end, we are asked to judge it, which is that could these data plausibly have occurred by chance? And if they were very, very unlikely to have occurred by chance, then that raises what from the legal system is known as reasonable doubt. And so you are asked to find that they are guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. So if you have a reasonable doubt that this could have happened, you always side with innocence. You always side with the null. If it doesn't look extreme, you just say, okay, there's not enough evidence to convict. We must make a decision. So that is the goal of this, is that given a situation like this, and given a difference, and given some numbers, we must make a decision about whether the results could plausibly have happened by chance, or actually represent some true underlying effect which shows a dependent relationship. That is the point of this course. So the question is, if we were to repeat the experiment today, would our cultural mores have changed this? You'd think so, wouldn't you? The answer is no. They did it two years ago. They ran the same trial uh, in a scientific world, so they placed it in the context of hiring a lab manager for a biochemistry lab, and they took a file that was highly qualified, Ivy League education, great grades, great reference letters, randomized the name at the top. Still happening. Men are seen as more competent through nothing more than being men. And it's not fair, and it's not right, but it is our society to this day. We had an election last year in the United States, and the misogyny was everywhere. It's still very much a real thing. So yeah, your generation is the first one that has a real shot of maybe beating it. Because your generation is, for the first time in a long time, a welcoming sort of accepting of people's differences. It's not universal. But when you compare it to my parents' generation and your parents' generation, things are changing now at a more rapid pace than they have in a very, very long time. Just look at how fast. Actually, I'll bring this in for the next class. Um, so in the United States, they're a great test case because they're so broken. And there's so many things wrong with their society that you can see things changing. For example, interracial marriage in the United States was actually illegal in a lot of states up until the 90s. Okay, and so you can, there is a great plot which demonstrates the years that different states gained the right for people to marry if they are interracial, which is in the United States, that's code for a white person marrying anyone who doesn't have white skin. It doesn't matter what you are, you know, whether you're from Mexican origins, Spanish origins, black, it doesn't matter, white people with anything else was illegal. And you can look at the years that it happened, and it was really slow. There were a few states that were legal all along, and then it just very slowly got overturned across the whole US. And then you compare that to the legalization of gay marriage, and the curve goes like this. In a period of one generation, it went from being completely illegal to almost universally legal. And that is partially because of cultural changes due to generational changes. Um, basically, your generation just doesn't care anymore. It's not that you have a strong feeling one way or the other. You just don't care. It's a very live and let live kind of society that you're going to produce, we hope. So it's all up to you. Don't screw it up. You know, you, it's in your hands. But you're right. It should have gotten better. And if you did it purely with bank managers, maybe it would. But there are definitely still subsets of our society, like scientific world, where there is a very strong gender bias against women and competence. And it's not right, but it's there. I mean, it's happening in the tech world, too. There's that, that kind of exploded in the last year as well. So it's, it's still a thing, unfortunately. However, give it another generation and you'll fix it because women are currently 65% of university grads. At some point, you're just going to swamp the men and they won't have an option but to admit that you're competent or they won't have any employees. All right, let's continue with this trial. If the evidence is not strong enough to reject the prior assumption of innocence, we say that they are not guilty. The jury is not allowed to come back and say that the defendant is innocent. 
You cannot prove innocence because it requires proving everything. But you can say there is not enough evidence for us to conclude that they are guilty. They are not guilty. Subtle difference, but it is a real difference, and it's one that you need to be aware of. So the defendant may, in fact, be innocent, but the jury has no way of being sure. There is a bench override in this case where judges can say, look, this is such a ludicrous trial. It is very clear this person didn't do it. We've caught the other person since this trial started. Can we just get this over with? And they nullify the entire trial. They wipe it clean, and they say, you are fully innocent, free to go, no charges, no penalty. We were wrong. It's pretty rare, but it does happen. So said statistically, we never accept the null hypothesis because that would be saying we believe in the innocence of the null hypothesis. All you can do is say we didn't have enough evidence to conclude anything different than the default position. We're sticking with the default. So it's a subtle language thing, but it is important. And you will, as you, as you progress through your education, you will see papers and you will actually start to see how this comes out in science. So the question is, what about Papirian philosophy? And the answer is, when you take a graduate course in statistics, I will talk about that. But it is well beyond the scope. Essentially, it's the idea from a philosophical point of view, how do we actually prove something? How do we actually falsify something? And it's, it's extremely subtle. And the fact that you've been exposed to it is great, but it's not something you really need to worry about because it's, it's mostly you can just use the cookbook that I'm going to show you. But it is something that if you do graduate school, may come back up again. And the man's name was Karl Popper, his Karl with a K, and he was quite a famous philosopher from the 50s and 60s. And he wrote several books on statistical falsification and, and how we think about falsifying data and how we actually reason as human beings and how we, how we come to truths. So it's interesting stuff, but it's way too abstract for a first year course in stats. So in a trial, the burden of proof is on the prosecution in a hypothesis test the burden of proof is on the thing that's unusual that's not the same that's not the null so in our case the default position is always that nothing is going on the burden of proof is on the side of there's something going on that's the side that has to justify itself so recap we start with the null hypothesis that represents the status quo the nothing going on nothing has changed nothing is different we Find an alternative hypothesis that represents our research question, the thing we're trying to answer. Is there gender discrimination in promotion scenarios with male managers? We conduct a hypothesis test under the assumption that the null is true. That's how you set it up, is you assume the null is true, and then you do the test from that. And if the test results suggest that the data do not give convincing evidence for the alternative, then you stick with the null, you fail to reject it. And if you do get convincing evidence and you are convinced, then the judge goes guilty and you pronounce the whole hypothesis guilty and the alternative wins. That's statistical testing in a nutshell. The rest of this semester will be spent performing increasingly sophisticated variations of this problem. So. Before we can actually finish the problem, and I'm going to finish it before the end of the lecture, we need to be able to talk about some things. So we're going to do some probability. This is most of the content of assignment three, which is up right now. If you want to review the book's variation of it, it is the appendix, appendix A1, and it is a primer on probability. If you took the data structures or whatever it's called course in high school, you'll have already seen this. If you haven't, it's really not that complicated. It's like playing board games. Just visualize playing board games, rolling dice, and everything kind of works out how you'd expect. We want to talk about how probable things are. So some notation. An event is usually denoted by an uppercase Roman letter, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, things like that. So if you see one of those referring to an event, then here's an example. Let's say I have a fair coin. A fair coin is one in which a fair flip, a, a non tricksy magician flip, 50% chance of heads, 50% chance of tails. That's what's fair. It's a fair 50-50 coin. Let's say I flip it. And A is the event that once I flip it, it's going to come down with heads up. We're going to get a heads on our flip. 
Then what is the probability of this? It is all the cases where that can happen. There's one head side over all cases that the coin could land on. There's only two sides. We are obviously excluding the case where you manage to land it on its side and it rolls around for a while and it stays on its side and it never makes a decision. Let's say you flip it and it actually lands on a face. Then A is the event that the coin lands with heads facing up and the probability of that happening is 0 0.5, 50-50. The complement of something in statistics and probability is the probability of it not happening, which is by its very construction all of the other stuff that could possibly happen. So in the case of our coin flip, if it lands with heads facing up, the complement is heads doesn't face up, which by process of elimination means tails faces up. And the probability of tails facing up is 1 over 2 or 50%. And The probability, uh, I'll, go, I'll come back to this, but then the probabilities add up to one, as they should, because you've got heads facing up and all of the rest of the cases possible. And the total thing together will happen. And so the total thing has probability one. Here's another example. Let's say you're waiting for the East Bank bus. It's supposed to come at 1042. The A event would be the bus arrives on time with probability zero. And the A complement event is that the bus does not arrive on time with probability one. It's not a bad bus system, but it's not perfect. Some information from the math point of view. For something to be a probability, it must be a number between zero and one inclusive. Zero and any number you want up to and including one. You cannot have a probability of 1.2. You cannot have a probability of 56. So be careful. We often interpret probabilities as percentages, but the actual probability numbers are always between 0 and 1. If something is an event with probability 0, we say it will never happen. It's impossible. And if something has probability 1, then it is certain to happen. Question? Yes, absolutely. Here's, what, here's an event that has probability one. I flip a coin and it lands on either the heads or the tails. If you're willing to be clever or just obnoxious, you can come up with events with probability one with very little difficulty. You can also come up with events with probability zero. Sorry? Probability is not zero. Probability is exceptionally small, but it's not zero. It could happen, and it has happened in the past. So you don't exclude things. The probability is probably 1 in 10 million. It's not going to happen, probably. But is it probability zero? No, because probability zero says it cannot possibly happen. So tomorrow's the weekend, probability zero. I mean, you can make it the weekend, but it's not actually the weekend. So be careful with that. Probability zero is genuinely this cannot happen. And probability one is this absolutely will happen. So one minus the probability, this is the relationship. These two add to, to one. And that's important. So the probability of A happening plus the probability of all of the other possible cases happening is everything. And that probability of everything is one. And so that would be the probability of flipping a coin and getting a head or a tail. That's probability one. The probability of rolling a die and getting one, two, three, four, five, or six facing up is probability one. The probability that the sun will come up tomorrow is not probability one. It's very, very close, but there's nothing stopping the sun from having a supernova event tomorrow night or tonight and just not coming up tomorrow when we're all dead. It's a low probability, mind you, but it could happen. So you have to be very careful. So this is, it will snow tomorrow. <laughs> if the probability of it snowing tomorrow were 70%, then the probability of it not snowing tomorrow would be 30%, the leftovers from that. So let's talk about sample spaces. 
A sample space is the set of all of the possible outcomes. So you can list them. You can say, I'm flipping a coin. What are all of the possible outcomes of flipping this coin? I could get a head. I could get a tail. That's all of the events in the sample space. Let's say I roll a die. And I want to talk about all the different ways a die could face up. One, two, three, four, five, six. Those are all the events in that sample space. Clearly defining your sample space is incredibly important to make a probability problem work. Uh, our TA, Carlone, has been talking about that in the Slack chat the last couple days as people have started the assignment early and hadn't seen the lecture yet. And so in that case, you have to be very careful and go, okay, what is it asking about? What category am I restricting myself to? That's 100%. Those probabilities have to add up to one across that sample space. If outcomes have the same chance of occurring, we say they are equally likely. This would be examples like fair coins, fair dies, and so on. Things where everything can happen, but with equal probability across the board. So here's an example for you to think about for a moment. Probability of you dying on a Sunday. I'm not specifying the year. You know, you'll be 97 and, and tired and ready to go, and it's a Sunday. What is the probability of you dying on a Sunday versus Thursday? Or a Monday? Or a Tuesday? Or a Friday? Is that equal probability across the days? What do you think? Is you dying a completely random event like somebody rolling a seven-sided die? What kills you? What could kill you? Let's be macabre. Run over by a car, heart attack, cancer, hit by a bus, plane crash, terrorism, meteor, earthquake, lightning strike. There are many things that could kill you. Are our deaths as an aggregate across the human race equally spaced by day? Everybody together. If you take all the deaths that happened in the last week, did they happen with equal probability on any given day of the week? No. Why? Mondays are higher. Does that help anybody? The work week is an influencer on human mortality. More heart attacks happen on Monday than any other day of the week. So automatically it means that the probability of dying, of you dying, is not equal on any given day of the week. Mondays are more probable because of health-related things which kill you at work. And you go back to work and it's been a long weekend and maybe you're hungover and you get crushed by a 10-ton press or you have a heart attack. Or you aren't paying attention and you walk off something and we're down you go. There's a lot of ways you can die and Mondays are dangerous, which is why we should just all sleep in on Mondays. Yes. So be careful. Don't assume that things are the same unless you have evidence to support it. Here's an experiment. We roll a die, one to six. Okay, that's what can happen. If A is the event, and this is where you kind of start to see that events don't have to be really simple things. A is the event that you roll a die and you get an even number. So what are the events that match that categorization? I'm rolling a die, I get an even number of two, even number of four, even number of six. Can I get an eight? So the assumption is anytime you see this without any sort of modifier on it, this is a six-sided die, or for the nerds in the room, a d6. It's not a d8, it's not a d10, it's not a d12, it's a d6. It's a dice with six sides. So equal probability, the even numbers from that are two, four, and six. So that is event A. And you can find the probability, P of A, by taking the number divided by the total. So there were three of those. You divide it by six, which is the total, and you get a probability of a half. 50-50 of getting an odd or an even number on the roll of your die. If B was the event that you roll less than three, a one or a two matches that. 
there are two numbers in that set, divide that by the six numbers in the total set, probability of a third, one in three chance of doing that. This is how odds are created for gambling games. So anybody ever played craps? A few people? Roulette? You've seen roulette played? You've all watched Ocean's Eleven or some variation thereof, a movie that takes place in a casino? You've seen roulette and craps played. The probabilities are set up in those games using this sort of logic to set it up so that you have a 48 to 49% chance of winning on any given game. Just remember that. The house always wins. The probability of you winning is always very slightly less than half. And that doesn't even take into account the stuff that isn't dice games, like slots, where the probability of winning can be horrific. So this is, how, this is the formal formula for a discrete probability, is if everything is equally likely, which is the only case we're really going to deal with for the moment, then you take the number of possible outcomes, you just count them up, and you divide them by the number of possible total outcomes in the overall experiment. Number of die faces which match your restriction divided by six. Number of head faces that match your restriction divided by two, and so on, and so on. So if the sample space is six and the event is one and two, then you get two over six or one third, just like the last slide. Here's another example. Let's say a family has two children. We assume that when having a child, the probability of that family having a boy or a girl is exactly equally probable. 50-50 chance of boy and girl. So, test of your physiology. Is this true? What is the true ratio? Anybody know? Probably having a boy is 51.7%. Because boys are stupid and get themselves killed. That's really what it is. It's an evolutionary imperative to always have a few more males around because we tend to do stupid things like start wars and kill ourselves. <laughs> and so, you know, you don't need quite as many females to repopulate the race um, when you're not going to go off and get yourself killed to stupid shit. So the probability of having a boy is very slightly higher than the probability of having a girl. You can see this demographically in a place like China, which ran a one-child policy for a while. And because the probability of having a boy is very slightly higher, and there were societal imperatives in place to encourage people to have a boy, they currently have a 20 to 30 million male demographic bulge, where they have more males than females in China among a certain age group. Because males are more likely by default, and the families wanted boys anyways, and so when you have just one child, it doesn't balance out. So here's an event. A is the event that the two children had by this family are both girls. So two girls. Girl and girl. The sample space is a boy, then a girl, a boy, then a boy, a girl, then a boy, and a girl, then a girl. Those are the four different ways you can have two children with binary gender. So boy, 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 girl, girl, boy, girl, girl. The probability of getting girl, girl, assuming this equality, is then the one case we want over everything. One case divided by four cases or a 25% probability of having girl, girl as your two children. And we could do it the other way with the true probability, but this is a nice little example as is. Here's another example for you. Everybody know what Lotto 649 is? Most people know what Lotto 649 is. It is a lottery that's run weekly in Ontario. The lottery is set up so that you choose six numbers between 1 and 49. What is the probability of if you just buy one ticket and then the number is actually chosen completely at random, the probability of you winning with that one ticket is 1 over 13,983,816 or 0 0.00000007. It's small. By comparison, last year, your chances of getting hit by lightning were only 1 in 700,000. So one in every 700,000 people in North America was hit by lightning last year, which sounds like it's not very many, but it's still more probable than winning Lotto 649 with a single ticket. So doesn't mean you don't play, just means you be realistic about your options and know that you're not going to win. Absolutely. You can buy as many tickets as you want. So what you're doing is you're increasing the numerator 
One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So yes, buying two tickets doubles your chances of winning to 0 0.0000014. Oh. And then you buy four tickets. And now you're 0 0000028. And before you know it, you're still not winning. <laughs> lotteries are, <laughs> there's an old, old saying, lotteries are a tax on the gullible. They're not a way to win money. They're not a reliable sort of setup. There are exceptions, the things like the Princess Margaret lottery and things like that, where the money is at least going to a good cause and you kind of can feel good about just giving the money and maybe you win a car. That's kind of cool. But like these Lotto 649 things, like the chances of winning are so incredibly low that it's not like you should ever play it seriously. Play it for fun if you want, but don't expect to win. And that's just Lotto 649. Lotto Max is even worse. All right, and. So this is a logical operator and also Boolean logic. So if you've ever done any computer software stuff, you'll know about this. The idea is we can combine events by saying and, which takes everything in both of them and puts it together. So if we take a student at Trent is taking math 1051 this year, there's 590 odd of you at the moment out of 8,000 something. I don't know, it keeps going up. Then we, can, we know what the probability, if I just close my eyes and I'm out in the quad by OC and I'm just like, you, what's the problem that I just pointed at someone who's actually in math 1051? That's something we could compute. And event B is you are a student at Trent and you have brown hair. And I close my eyes and I wave myself around and I'm all blindfolded. I'm like, you, and do you have brown hair? We can compute that probability. So the and event is both of those things. It's the probability of you being in math 1051 and having brown hair. And so it's the two together only. So it doesn't include the cases where you're one or the other. So it doesn't include the brown haired students who aren't in math 1051. And it doesn't include all of the people in this room with blonde, red, black, purple hair. Only the brown haired people. Question. It, not really, in the sense that what we're trying to do here is I was just trying to demonstrate the fact that this probability is computable. I could put all the Trent students in one room if I wanted to. And then I could go through and I could go, OK, all the brown haired people, you stay, please. Everybody else, you can go. And then I say, all right, everybody who's not in my class, get out of here. And what's left is the set of all of the brown haired people enrolled in Math 1051 students. That's the and. I forced both of those to be true simultaneously. And that is a number which I could enumerate. And I go, OK, there's 75 of you. 75 math 1051 students with brown hair. Those 75 students, relative to the probability of overall. And we could actually compute that probability. So that's what and does, is it combines the two things. How many people know what a Venn diagram is? Most people? OK. This is the Venn diagram for a logical and in probability. It's the colored in area. This is event A. This is event B. This is A and B. Both of those have to be true at the same time. And the probability would then be scaled by the sample space. So we would take those 75 brown haired math 1051 students and we would divide that by 8,753 or whatever the total number of students at Trent at the moment is. Then the probability of randomly seeing a brown haired math 1051 student would be that number from the whole student body. The or is the other way of combining them. And that's where I don't care which is which. And I say, all right, brown haired students, great. Math 1051 students, great. Both of those are what I'm looking for for this experiment. So how many of those are there? And so in that case, it wouldn't matter whether you're both or not. Or you could do MacBook users, 
instead of brown hairs. You just, it's just something where you have a very clear yes, you are, or no, you aren't. So if I have an event A, which is student at Trent taking my class, and I have event B, which is that you use and own a MacBook, and I combine them, and I want the OR event, it's A together with B and together with the stuff in the middle. Now, there is a subtle variation of this called exclusive OR, which you may have seen before. We don't really deal with that one as much, at least not in the introductory course. So this would be the event A or B, and this is again S. Question? Why do you OR it in also bring out the AND? Yeah, so the question is, when you do OR, do you also get the AND bit, the, the intersection in the middle? Yes. If you do exclusive OR, you, you exclude that AND bit. But in, in the case of OR here, we take all the stuff in A and all the stuff in B, and we throw it all in a bag, and that's our new thing. This comes from philosophy. Sometimes written like that. OR from math. Uh, sorry. And or either of those. Something upward facing like a cup is actually the or, and something downward facing like a concave shape is the and. That's the next slide. Yes. So his question is, if I take all the students in the class, and I throw you all in the sack, and then I take all the students at Trent who use MacBooks, and I throw you in the sack, I will have double counted a whole bunch of you. Because a bunch of you are in this class and have MacBooks. So what happens with that? Obviously, I can't throw you in the sack twice. And I should be careful when you're doing this just symbolically that I don't double count those people. And that is absolutely correct. And that is the next idea. So uh, it, I'm going to use this as a motivating example to show you how this works. Here's a table, a frequency table, which is, again, this is a categorical contingency table. So this is people in this class and their methods of transportation. It's a survey done a few years ago. It's not actually you guys, but whatever. So I have male students in this class. I have female students in this class. And my total is not even remotely correct. Sorry about that. So the males drive alone to school. 19 people in this class meet that categorization from the surveyed people. None of the males carpool. So males really hate carpooling. They want to sing their, their Taylor Swift songs all by themselves. Thank you very much. <laughs> Transit, 25. Walking, 3. And none of them want to bike and save the environment or something. I don't know. Make up excuses. 22 females drive alone. They like to sing along to their rap or whatever it is they're doing that they want to keep private. Six females carpool, 25 transit, five walking, two bicycling for a total of 60. So this is a frequency table. It's a contingency table where all we have is gender and means of transport to arrive at class. And we could, we could do this survey right now, except if we did this survey for this class, which category would explode? Walking. You're mostly first years. You're mostly in residence. You moved all of 67 feet to get here to class today. You didn't need to take a bicycle or a car or a transit. I don't even know how you would take a transit from like. OK, fine. So you live in one of the annexes, then you did. But nonetheless, the people on main campus, you people just walked. That's fine. So if I selected one student completely at random from this table, In this case, uh, you can have a frequency table which isn't a contingency table, but a contingency table always is a frequency table. So this is a contingency table. It just And these individual things, these are called frequencies. So this is a frequency. It's how many times it happened in your data set. Select one student of the 107 completely at random. What is the probability that student is female and uses transit. 
So first off, when you're doing female, that means we get rid of this. Don't need the total. We're in that row. Then what is the probability that they use transit? That is the cell which corresponds to female transit. So what would the probability be of a randomly chosen member of that 107 students being both female and having taken transit to arrive at class? How many people in the total set meet that categorization? 25. How many people are in the total set? What's the probability? 25 over 107. What about probability that you're male or in the next slide? So this one will be 25 over 107. In the next slide, I'm going to go into that in more detail. So here is 25 students who are female and transit. So we've got the transit and the female. And so we have 25 over 107, which is 0.234. Now let's do male or, what did I say? Walking. Male means this. Walking means this. But this time it's or, not and. So instead of using the box, which represents both of those together, I allow anything in the male column. So this one, this one, this one, this one, and this one. And anything in the walking column, this one. Sorry, that's the total. But then we get back to that question about double counting, and that three would get counted a second time. Because if I'm adding all this up, I would go across, and I would get all of these, 19, 0, 25, 3, and 0, which is 47. That's all of the male students in my survey. And then I'd get 5 and 3 together, which is 8 which is there, but when I use the 8 and the 47 together, I have counted the three male walkers twice. And so I need to remove that double counting case from my consideration. So I take 47 plus 8, which is all of the males and all of the walkers, and then I go, wait a minute, I double counted there. I double counted the male walkers, so I subtract the second count of them. So you throw them all in the sack, and then you pull a few of them back out. Divide that total number of 52 by 107, and we have a 0.486 probability of this having happened. Does that make sense? Assignment 2 has you doing this a few times, so you'll get to practice and try it all out. What about transit or walking? So take 10 seconds to stare at it. Transit or walking. What's the probability? 58 divided by 107. There are 50 students who use transit as their method for arriving at class. There are eight who use walking as their method for arriving at class. 50 plus 8 divided by 107. And you're done. There are no students who do both, because we only allowed you to tick off one method of arrival. Even if you walked to the bus stop, took the bus stop to Trent, pulled your bike off the front of the bus, and cycled to class, I don't care, you use transit. You have to pick one. And so we're not allowing for students to have done both, which means these are considered to be what is known as a mutually exclusive event. They don't overlap in any way. And the Venn diagram for a mutually exclusive event looks like that. Two circles that do not touch, no overlap whatsoever. When you have mutually exclusive events, there's nothing to subtract because you didn't double count anything. We say that two events are mutually exclusive if they cannot happen at the same time. In that case, if you do the and, you equal zero. So I can give you an example. Female student at Trent and currently uses Solaris as their operating system on their personal computer. 
Why? Because there's no one left at Trent who uses Solaris as their personal operating system because it's antiquated. Could, if I had said something a little bit more specific, like Windows 95, maybe there's somebody somehow left here who has Windows 95 on a computer in their dorm or in their house. It's theoretically possible. But Solaris is so broken and old that like nobody would ever use it. Can you come up with an example? Just think. Something where the and immediately cancels. And you can get really crazy to do it. So male students in this class and astronauts. Unfortunately, none of you are astronauts. <laughs> astronauts don't really go through a program per se. They're selected and then heavily trained, and they usually don't get up into space until they're twice your age. So yeah, you're not astronauts. What else can you do? You can very easily come up with examples. Males in this class and people who are six foot seven and higher. I don't think we have anybody quite that high, right? Females in this class and people who are under three feet. You're old enough to not be, not be that short, right? You, know, you can come up with a bunch of examples, right? It's really easy to come up with things that are mutually exclusive. And it, as soon as you start doing things that have nothing to do with one another, it's even better. You know? Like multimillionaire and choosing to study philosophy. Like, like you, you know, your, your profession and your, your, your choice when you are a student to go in school is only very slightly correlated. And so on. There's lots of ways to do it. If P, A, and B is 0, then the formula for OR, this is the formal formula for OR, says that the probability of having A or B is all the stuff in A and all the stuff in B minus that duplicated bit that doubled up, the MacBook users that I put in the sack twice. So you exclude that by subtracting away one of the two copies, and that's what this is. And the OR, well, as soon as you're doing OR, it doesn't actually matter. Well, sorry, when you're doing OR with a mutually exclusive, this becomes zero, and it just becomes adding up the two categories. So you go transit is 50, walking is 8, 50 plus 8 is 58, and we're done. No excluding double counts. Here's a few more examples. Let's say I have a six-sided die. I roll it. What's the probability that I get an odd number or a number bigger than three? So what are the two cases? Odd numbers are one, three, and five. Number greater than three is four, five, and six. So I have three cases and three cases, but how many duplicated cases do I have? One, because this five got used twice. So the probability of this happening is therefore 3 plus 3 minus 1 over 6, or 5 over 6. And the only thing that doesn't meet that or is 2. 1, 3, and 5 are odd, and 4 and 6 are bigger than 3. So it's just 2 that's excluded, so a 5 sixths chance. I'll leave the other. Uh, Dice rolls, just practice. It's just kind of trying to get your head around how you set them up. For discrete cases, it's reasonably straightforward. Probabilities can be estimated with relative frequencies based on experiment or observation as well. And this was the whole point of this type of regression. If I toss a coin 10 times in a row, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and I get four heads, then based purely on that experiment, I would say that the probability of getting heads on the next flip of my coin is 410. Assuming I know nothing else about the coin except that I have done this experiment 10 times, and in those 10 times I got four heads and six tails, I would say, okay, if I repeat this experiment and I flip the coin one more time, what's the chances of getting a head? Well, I've seen it four out of 10 times. I expect to get it four out of 10 times in the future. This is your first hint at how we do these statistical things is we are going to do this kind of thing to estimate the chances of things happening where we don't know the truth. And that's the essence of science, is we're trying to determine the truth that we don't actually know. So we take our best guess, which is based on our frequencies. Why do we estimate these? Well, theoretical probabilities are actually hard to compute. <laughs> this may be the only way you can get anything from your data, 
or from your experiment. Uh, we may not even trust the theoretical probability models. And simulations are these experiments that are used to find probabilities. And that is the entire point of what we're doing. So uh, we're about to go back to the experiment for the gender bias study. I just want to sort of show you one more thing. It's a very obvious extension. So frequency tables as probabilities. I'm going to go back a couple of slides just to show you something again. Every probability I computed for this, I counted up all the cells that applied and then had to divide the total by 107, right? There's a slightly different way of formulating this, which is I can take the entire table and divide it by 107. And then when I add them up, I'm done. I don't have to divide by 107 at the end. And that is known as a probability or fre probability frequency table. And so it looks something like this, where you have your categories, you have your numbers, And so what happens, though, is that when you have it set up, the sum of all of the cells is 1. So I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So in one of these tables, you'll have all these cells. They'll represent some categorizations. And the cells themselves will add up to 1 then they're already converted to overall probabilities for you. There are some problems like this on the assignment. That's why I want you to see it. It's in the textbook as well. And there's one subtlety that may not be obvious. If the question asks you to find a probability for a specific cell relative to a specific column, that you have to be careful because what it's saying is restrict yourself to this column, then determine the probability of this cell. And so what we would do in that case is we'd take the cell and we would divide it by all of the column entries added together. So if we take that example and we go back to our transit, it would be if I select a student at random from the class and they say, I use transit, what's the probability they are a male student? You see, you restrict yourselves to only the transit students, only the transit columns, and then you say, given that you have that, what would the probability of a given cell be? And so it's not relative to the whole, it's relative to the column. So there's, there's a one, maybe two questions on the assignment that ask you to do just that. You get the seven trials again, so you should be able to figure it out. But play around with that, make sure you get your head around it. Let's talk about this simulation again. So context, one more time. 48 male bank managers from the 1970s evaluating a bunch of files. If the results are based entirely on chance, and it was just chance that those women were rejected for their promotion, then if we repeat an experiment based on that setup, by chance, we want to know how often we'd see something like what we saw, where 29.2% difference. So this is where simulations come in. And you'll notice that the name of your textbook is randomization and simulation. This is where we start doing that. So we will want to simulate this. And if what we find is that what we saw in reality looks really weird compared to the simulations, then that means it probably was not by chance. It was an extreme event, and it was unlikely. And we reject the assumption of innocence. And we say, no, you're guilty. You people are gender biased. How do we set this up? We're going to use the deck of playing cards. Everybody knows the deck of playing cards, 52 cards. You've all played a game with cards at some point in your life. So we have four suits, clubs, spades, diamonds, and hearts. There are 13 cards in each suit. 13 times 4 is 52. There are three face cards in each suit, the jacks, the queens, and the kings. 
Then we have the aces, which is sort of like a 1, but also a 13, depending on what game you're playing. And then we have the numbered cards, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So we're going to use a deck of playing cards because it's a little bit bigger than the case that we had, and we're going to use it to simulate. So take the juggers, throw them out. Take out three aces. And we're going to use the alternative definition where this is ace equals face. Even though it isn't, it doesn't have a face on it. We're going to pretend they're face cards like you do in a lot of games like Euchre. Take out one remaining number card. You are left with 35 numbered cards between 2 and 10. Out of 36, you have 13 faces. What do those numbers represent? Anybody remember from the start of class the gender discrimination? What were the 35 and 13 numbers? Of the 48 files, which is what we've now down to, 35 of those files were promotions. And 13 of those files were rejections. So once we've done that, we take those 48 cards now, 48 bank managers, shuffle them. And then I just start dealing them out. You go to a mail, you go to a mail. I'm just sending these out to the bank managers one at a time. Once I've gone through all 48 cards, I've got 24 cards there, 24 cards there. And I say, those are the female cards, because it's entirely arbitrary how the files were distributed in the first place. Those are the male cards, 24 of each. I flip them over. I find out how many face cards are in each pile. I have just repeated the experiment, except I have assumed there is absolutely no structure, no dependency. It's purely random how the female males ended up in their piles. So here's a picture of that thing. So take a full deck of cards, throw out three aces, and throw out a single 10. Then the net result is that I have 13 no promotes, and I have 35 promotes for a total of 48 cards. And then you've got the cards. You've dealt cards before. Start dealing. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. You, know, you just keep dealing 24 and 24 until you're done. Then you take those stacks, you flip them over, and you see how you did. How many females were promoted, how many males were not. So in one example where I've done it, I shuffle them, I split them into groups. I have in the mail stack, I have 18 non-face cards. So 18 of those males were promoted. In the female stack, I have 17 non-face cards. So 17 out of 24 were promoted. And so in this case, I have numbers of 75 and 71%, a difference of 0.042 or 4.2%. What was the percent in our actual experiment? 29. So straight away we're like, well, those are not very similar. 4%, 29%, those are quite different. I'm starting to lean toward the side of the people who looked at it and went, yeah, of course there's gender bias. Look at that. So let's do it again, though. What one simulation proves nothing? Not yet. I mean, it does provide evidence, but it's not convincing entirely because we've only done it once. What if I do it again? And again, and again, and again, and again. And you're like, you want me to deal the deck of cards how many times now? And you're like, no, of course I don't. You have this thing in front of you called a laptop. And it runs a computer programming language called R. And each run of this, where you take the deck of cards and you slice it in half and you determine how many were in each stack, takes one one millionth of a second. So I ran 100,000 of them in the time it takes me to blink. And what do I see? The difference is between the two promotion rates. This is just 100 simulations in this are broken up like this. Lots of things near zero. And only a few in the range of near 29.2%. The original result from the Applied Journal of Psychology is right there. 
So remember the wording that I used for the legal trial thing. You need to have convincing evidence against the null hypothesis. It needs to not look like the average case. Of 100 trials, how many were like the one that we saw in reality? Three of them had the difference but in favor of the women. And two of them had the difference but in favor of the men. Five out of 100. A 5% chance is pretty low. And so given these, it actually works out when you actually draw the line and you take the stuff above. Only two out of those hundreds, two in 100 chance, that is low. So our conclusion statistically would be that we do have evidence to reject that null. There is evidence of gender bias in that hiring decision. Assignment number three is due the end of the week. I will see you next week. Have a good day.